Okay, returning to the topic of speech with which this essay, Variations on the Standard Treatment, begins. It also ends there, starting around page 291. At the top there you see Lacan ask, what is speech? Well, one thing we know about speech, and this is going to be a key theme in what he's developing here, is that it's, it is intersubjective. As we said at the start of this, and as Lacan suggested as well, that speech is addressed, and addressed to an other. And the question then becomes, what is the relationship that speech establishes with this other? And the other, in listening, is communicating at the same time. If you're talking to somebody, and they're listening, they are inevitably doing things that are communicating to you that they are listening. Maybe they're nodding. Maybe they're focused on you with their eyes. These are all ways that speech or symbolic action is moving in a two-way street. Just because you're the one talking doesn't mean that it's a one-way street. Listening is a very active enterprise. There are ways to tell people that you're not listening to them, like breaking eye contact with them, like fidgeting, like checking your watch, checking your phone, whatever the case may be. These are all ways that you communicate to them that you're not listening, just as there are ways that you can communicate to them that you are. So speech is going to be an intersubjective thing. Now let's hear what Lacan means by this. On 291, third full paragraph, it is thus an act, and as such, it presupposes a subject. But it is not enough to say that in this act the subject presupposes another subject, for it is rather that he establishes himself here by being the other, but in a paradoxical unity of the one and the other by means of which, as I showed earlier, the one defers to the other in order to become identical to himself. Pretty wordy, pretty wonky, but it's the first approach at intersubjectivity. Lacan's not going to develop this. We can thus say that speech, continues on page 291, manifests itself as a communication in which the subject, expecting the other to render his message true, proffers his message in an inverted form, and in which this message transforms him by announcing that he is the same. Let's bear with this. As is seen in any promise made, in which the declarations, you are my wife and you are my master, signify I am your husband and I am your disciple. So if you tell someone that you are their wife, there's a reciprocal utterance, an inverted form in which the truth of that utterance presupposes that they also have a certain relationship to you. If it's a heteronormative scene, it would also presume the response, and I am your husband. That's what he's getting at here. Um, the same with you are my master, I am your disciple. If someone says you are my teacher, the inverted expression that I don't need to say is, and you are my student. It's implied. A reciprocal relationship between the two people is implied in a statement like that. This is what Lacan elsewhere is going to define as full speech. In part, there are other ways that he defines full speech differently that we're going to get to now. Speech thus seems to be an all the more true instance of speech. True speech. The less its truth is based on what is known as its correspondence to the thing. So here we're not looking at an understanding of speech that is dealing with references in the world, in reality. We're looking at um, speech, the test of which is not its correspondence to stuff in the world, but its truthfulness relative to the speaker and the person addressed. True speech is thus paradoxically opposed to true discourse, their truth being distinguished by the fact that True speech constitutes the recognition by the subjects of their beings insofar as they are invested in them. So true speech has to do with the intersubjective relationships between people that are constituted and maintained and revised through speech, while true discourse is constituted by knowledge of reality insofar as the subject targets reality and objects. So true speech has to do with intersubjectivity, 
and true knowledge has to do with the objective world, the world as it's thrown out there, objectare, thrown out into the environment. It has to do with stuff. But each of the truths distinguished here is altered when it crosses the path of the other truth. So true speech has to do with a recognition of your relationship to others. And true discourse has to do with the knowledge of reality. That's the distinction that he's being that he's drawing here. Move down a little bit more to the paragraph that begins, but. But true speech, questioning true discourse as to what it signifies, will find that one signification always refers to another signification in true discourse. No thing being able to be shown other than by a sign and will thus make true discourse seem to be doomed to error. So true discourse presumes that a signifier can have a referent in the world. I say cat, and you can point at that thing and be like, oh, there it is over there, the furry thing. But Lacan here is pointing out to the way that signifiers point not to stuff, but to other signifiers. The way we've discussed when you look up cat in the dictionary, you see furry, four-legged, other words pop up in the dictionary definition. And you have to understand the meaning of those words, which in turn have words attached to them, in order to understand the meaning of cat. So you have this web of signifiers that Lacan thinks is more important than the, quote, web of reference that true discourse would try and put forward. And that's why he says that it would prove that true discourse is doomed to error, because in the end, signifiers don't point to stuff. They point to other signifiers because they operate in a field known as language. And language is a differential system where in order to understand one element, you have to understand another element, which in turn requires you to understand another element and another element and another element. Again, a good example of this is a dictionary. So Lacan wants to kind of demote true discourse and elevate, especially for these purposes, which is a very technical document about how to do analysis, true speech. Well, let's see how he does this here. How in navigating between the, ah, mm-hmm, which one will you err on the side of? Of this inner accusation of speech, could the in intermediate discourse, that in which the subject and his design to get himself recognized, there's true speech, addresses speech to the other while taking into account what he knows of his being as given, there's true discourse. So this intermediate discourse that Lacan is putting forth here, I wouldn't focus too much on it, but it's this combination of true speech and true discourse. True speech because it's about recognition of oneself addressed to another and working that out. Um, and then also um, about knowledge of, of themselves. On 293, he continues this theme of true speech. It always operates by grounding the subject's speech in its mediation by another subject. And that's a really important element here. True speech always involves another subject, a listener, somebody with whom you're interacting. And that speech is always mediated through the listening and interpretation of another. Here we're talking about a dialectic of recognition, Lacan goes on to specify. Now, this is an important thing for us to note, and we can point it out in a really simple example. True speech always operates by grounding the subject's speech in its mediation by another subject. The importance of interpretation and the way that the other comes first here again becomes a theme. When you think about the expression, I mean, what I meant to say, that's not what I meant. I mean, I mean, these expressions we use all the time. The reason why we have a word or a discourse particle or a phrase like I mean is because we're constantly trying to disprove the truth of spoken discourse and human communication, which is that the meaning of our actions, whether they are speech or deed, is determined not by us and our intentions, but by how our actions have been received by others. In other words, you can mean to be as nice as possible, but if what you say hurts somebody's feelings, what is the true meaning of your speech? Is it niceness or meanness? The answer is meanness. It doesn't matter what you intended. It's not the thought that counts. 
It is the effect of that thought when put into speech or deed. It's how that thought was received when it found expression. So we have a phrase like, I mean what I meant to say, because we're constantly trying to reclaim the authority of truth and interpretation from our addressees, from others, and say, no, 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 don't focus on the effects of my discourse, focus on what I intended to say. And the reason why we have that expression is because the truth of human communication is that meaning is more dependent on the audience than it is on the speaker. It's how our words are felt and interpreted by others that determine their meaning more than any conscious intent that we might put into them. And that's partly what Lacan is getting at here. The truth of one's speech is always grounded in another subject, in the interpretation of, in this case, an analyst. And that's where we're going to turn next.